right, so today I'm here with Paul Duffy. He's the CEO of AI ML Innovations. How you doing, Carl? Good, Good morning. I just wanted to say that I'm really uh, grateful uh, as a shareholder for you to be doing these updates very uh, very often yeah. on our, our platform with Ashley. I think shareholders are enjoying it. Yeah, well, I hope so. I mean, you know, my whole goal was to, you know, sort of be as transparent as possible to our shareholders. Yeah. There are an awful lot of balls in the air at AIML. Mm -hmm. um, today, obviously, we're going to talk about some pretty exciting stuff. Um, but I feel it's kind of like being uh, part of the plane as it takes off. Um, you know, sort of, sorry, we're building the plane as it takes off. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as I've always said, it's one part reality TV show, uh, one part reality. <laughs> well, I, you, you sort of got your, uh, your models of the first 100 days, and then you keep going on these 100-day loops. And I think right. it's, a, it's awesome for shareholders to kind of follow that journey. Yeah. And it's a small cap company. You've got lots of different companies, things going on. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just awesome to have someone who's willing to update shareholders that yeah, much. Yeah, I think it's very important. You know, when you're a micro cap like this, um, you know, things tend to turn quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and really all you need are a couple of dominoes to line up, one or two to fall and break the right way, and next thing you know, your stock starts driving. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's all about building not just value for our shareholders, but value in the technology that we're producing. So the intersection of healthcare, uh, artificial intelligence, as they come together, the products and the platforms that we build, they do a social good as well as an economic good. And right. so everything and all the team that's involved in this sort of get that win-win benefit right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about where we're at, I guess, what are we at? Uh, middle of Feb, early Feb, mm -hmm. and see where we're standing. Yeah, so today, Paul, we're here to talk about the Pulse Whisperer. Right. What is it, how does it work, yep. what's the pricing model? Yeah, so this is the first product that um, I'm proposing we release through HealthGage. It's based on their current 1.0 version of their platform, which for anybody that's used it, it's, it's sort of good, uh, but it needs a little bit of improvement. And so through the first 100 days, I took the Pulse Whisperer product, socialized it with a variety of what I would say paying early adopters, and out of that I got a very crisp value proposition and go-to-market strategy. And really, so what does that mean? This particular watch, which we sell that allows people to essentially get their blood pressure measurement, which will be a, a fun topic of discussion six weeks from now when we release the product Follow Your Heart which is essentially a rebranding and an improvement on this current product. But the smart sensor that exists within this watch does some pretty remarkable stuff that the iWatch, the Garmin, and the Fitbit don't do. What this allows you to do is capture a very robust time series signal, biometric measurements, for well over a minute. And there are millions of measurements that happen within the context of that one minute capture. And it runs natively through our patented neural network. Mm -hmm. And then we make the entire time series data capture available to researchers. So if you are a researcher at an academic institution, a healthcare institution, a government body that is studying things like long COVID, you know, which we'll talk about shortly, having accurate time series data from a wearable is gold. And so the Pulse Whisperer is essentially a product that allows any researcher full access to all the data that we capture off this phone, off this particular smartwatch. You can't do that on any existing wearable. So we've got this incredible niche that we can sell into, and this is the first product we're bringing into the market. I'm very excited about it. Yeah. So ideally, uh, this product yep. buys this product for its technology. Hey, well, if we're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to get into long COVID or sure, your partnership with Quarterstone? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we also announced that. One of the things that, uh, again, coming out of the first 100 days was, you know, let's look for robust uh, use cases on, quote, the health gauge biometrics platform. Um, so as I mentioned, the first version of it is not bad, what I would say a good early start. But to really muscle up to make it commercial, it needs a use case and an application that can go global. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like most things, we're looking around, you know, we're knocking on doors, you know, Mike, Andrew and I, we're making phone calls, we're talking to clinics, we're talking to researchers, investors, uh, other stakeholders in the healthcare system. 
And we kept hearing time and time again that long COVID was becoming a thing. Mm -hmm. And really what I mean by that is coming out of the pandemic, um, a lot of people still suffer from the ails of COVID. In fact, so much so that there's a small percentage of the population, some people will say between three and five, and groups like Dartmouth will say up to 14%, uh, of people who've actually had COVID experience these somewhat extensive um, you know, uh, ailments. So they have uh, brain fog, they get dizzy, they're lethargic, and they can't really pin it down. They just know that it fits within the context of COVID. And so the, the, the name for it, long COVID, has a very sort of, you know, I would say appropriate medical term and diagnosis to it. But what's not happening right now is there are no rehabilitation programs that are available for folks that are suffering from long COVID. And so, of course, as we're out canvassing early opportunities, we bump into some very innovative founders at a group called Cornerstone Physiotherapy here in Toronto. And uh, Adam Brown, who happens to be a bit of a guru in the long COVID space, has actually cracked the code on how to do long, co uh, long COVID rehabilitation. But more importantly, because he's very technically savvy, he developed it in a way that it could be delivered in a remote sense mm. if he could get accurate biometric measurements to complement the therapy in the program. So in other words, he would put an incremental data-informed approach together around the rehabilitation of long COVID. So for me, that fit pretty much the entire criteria that we were looking for to find that long and enduring opportunity to build out the next level of the Health Gauge Biometrics platform. And so earlier, um, probably about two weeks ago, we publicly announced mm -hmm. the beginning of this pilot program. And so we're looking to deliver the first phase of this into uh, Cornerstone and their patients through the February and March window. Of course, we'll learn, get feedback, iterate and improve. And then as we exit Q1, March uh, kind of 31 to April 7th, I think we got it targeted. We're going to then open it up as an actual product and platform that Cornerstone can use at large. So well beyond the confines of just Toronto. So Paul, is there a certain amount of uh, watches in this testing phase before they kind of scale it up that you've agreed to hand over to them? Well, we don't have a firm agreement on the actual number. Um, they have several hundred patients. Mm -hmm. So the expectation is as we begin to scale into the release of the uh, platform, into the program, the pilot itself, um, I believe from a watch point of view, every patient will require some sort of smart sensor that has that full time series data that I talked about with the Pulse Whisperer. So I'm expecting uh, quite a few sales of our smartwatch on the back of this. Cool. Um, you mentioned that you, you sort of, this opportunity kind of fell into your lap when you were out there trying to sell this product. Right. Um, can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on, on you know, the meetings and, and sort of, uh, was it a matter of just making cold calls or there was a connection through someone? Oh, sure. Knew? No, no. There's, there's a whole, you know, we refer to it as blitz scaling, right? So what we'll do, when we study a market, when we look specifically at what the early opportunities are, in truth, what you need to be able to do is sell what's already on the shelf. Trying to sell futures um, when you really don't have a steady state or a sophistication in your product build um, can be very dangerous. In other words, you can easily oversell what you're actually capable of delivering. And so particularly in this case with HealthGage, I wanted to sell something that would take the existing platform, the existing product, which is already available through the Apple Store and the Google Stores, uh, it's in market, Mm -hmm. We've readily available access to large supply chains for the hardware, and Bruce and his team at HealthGage can easily update the firmware and SDKs, et cetera. So there's really no capacity limitation there. Um, but what I wanted was I wanted a full solution around the watch. So instead of just buying it because it can take your blood pressure, what I wanted it to be able to do was solve a very unique therapy or program. And so we would literally reach out to clinics. We would cold call them. We would cold email them. We have services that'll book appointments for them. We essentially blitz mm -hmm. to get leads. Right. And once we've got the lead, it's just a function of finding the right product market fit at that time for that particular buyer. And so in Cornerstone's case, again, because of their sophistication with technology, they're already looking at how to use biometric measurements and remote rehab as an offer. So we kind of hit right period, right time, you know, and, 
a lot of work to get to that, but yeah. when you get there, it clicks. And then what I did is I said to the team, okay, we've got it. Let's step back now, absorb the need, develop the product map off of this, and bring it out in Q1, which is exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So you anticipate that you know, all the expectations you put out there to shareholders in regards to these uh, partnerships and products, that you'll be able to meet these deadlines. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, there's always so much stuff going on with your company. Yeah. Uh, and you're the man that has to head off everything and, and, and you know, look at things and, and find the value. Right. So what's next? <laughs> yeah, there's always something exciting happening every week at AIML. Um, so yeah, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on now, because uh, I think our shareholders are going to love this. Um, one of the things we are able to do with our technology is integrate it with a new tech that is coming out around micropayments. And so the same way we are able to use the Pulse Whisperer, uh, our Follow Your Heart product for your blood pressure measurement, we are now able to complement those rich data series with micropayment capability. And so when we introduce Hassan and his team, we'll share a little bit about where we're going with that. But this is something I think will be very transformative in healthcare, and we're going to be one of the first parties, uh, sorry, one of the first companies to the party. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I look forward to uh, finding out more about the micropayments business. Let's do it.